The prevailing narrative of African Middle Ages and pre-colonial era has unfortunately been co-opted by popular media to portray an image of a people with little invention, technology, or contribution to themselves or the world. And yet, nothing could be further from the truth. There are countless examples of such empires, and Ibrahim Njoya, affectionately called Njoya the Great, is yet another example that you will not hear about in history books. Njoya, who ruled from 1886 to his death in 1933, was the 17th Mufon in a dynasty that traced its origins back six centuries. At the end of the 19th century, the Sultan Ibrahim Njoya was an esteemed sovereign of very high intellectual and innovative zeal. Descendant of a dynasty that went back to the 13th century, King Njoya the Great brought fulgurant economic development to his kingdom. You see, King Njoya was one of the many African rulers who knew that knowledge was essential to the growth of his people, and he used every means necessary to elevate his people. As a result, the Bamum, in very little time, became a beacon of African many late medieval and pre-colonial civilizations you rarely hear of. Steadfast on his goal, King Njoya and his now-educated people independently developed a printer, a calendar system, a cartography system, a university system, and a mechanical corn mill. He also modernized the metallurgy industry of Bamun via the Shumom script. And to spread the knowledge that was now written using their own script, King Njoya also invented their own printing press. Like with the alphabet, so too with cartography. Njoya created a map, and it stands till this day as a great example of native cartography that hasn't been destroyed in the great African colonial purge, where many indigenous manuscripts and documents were systematically destroyed. Take, for example, the script of Great Zimbabwe that was destroyed by South African European descendants that didn't want an example of native African manuscripts to survive. Regardless, in 1912, King Njoya ordered that a survey be taken of his kingdom. A second survey was completed in 1920. Officially, these were meant to adjudicate land disputes. Clearly, he also would have been aware of the economic and societal advantage of having a common, agreed-upon, delineation of the land. Both times, the king himself led the surveying expedition. Each consisted of teams of bush clearers, surveyors, and servants. The surveyor's work was checked by about 20 topographers. In all, an expedition counted about 60 people. The surveyors and topographers worked out their own system to represent what they encountered, developing BAMUM standards to depict villages, markets, boundaries, and other common elements of topography. The map is oriented toward the west. Two disks represent the sun rising, bottom, and setting, top. Rivers are in purple, mountains in green. The script is, of course, in Joya's own. The surveyors did not have access to modern surveying equipment. To assess distances, they used watches to time how long it took them to get from A to B. At each village, a local guide would accompany a survey team to assess the extent of the locality, the names of streams and mountains, and other relevant information. One of the surviving notebooks from the first expedition shows that Njoya and his train of surveyors, servants, and topographers made 30 stops in 52 days and managed to cover about two-thirds of the kingdom. After less than two months, the start of the rainy season made roads impassable, putting a stop to the expedition. We mentioned that King Njoya developed a script for his people. This script evolved through many phases as a democratic exercise that involved the whole kingdom. The inhabitants of the kingdom would vote on the future iterations of the script along with other state affairs. Starting out with over 500 pictographs, it quickly evolved into a 35-character syllograph alphabet. King Njoya opened a school in Fumban where many were trained to become literate. Many manuscripts were produced introducing the histories, laws, and customs of Bamun and their neighbors. Another distinctive aspect of the Bamun is their superb architectural prowess. 
Bamum built immense castle with elaborately decorated pylons. Look at these beautiful surviving example of Bamum Castle. This building technique also spread out throughout northern Cameroon. Joya built a beautiful new palace, established what was in effect a museum, and was a patron of beadworkers, brass casters, weavers, dyers, and other craftsmen. His palace contained 300 looms and six dye pits with different colors, some of the dyes for which Njoya himself discovered. The arts flourished under his royal patronage. The Bamum are noted craftsmen. The men do embroidery, weaving, leatherwork, wood carving, ivory carving, metalwork, and blacksmithing, and the women make pottery. Both men and women cultivate the land. The Bamum are sedentary farmers who do some fishing but little hunting. Their principal crops are corn, maize, millet, cassava, and sweet potatoes. They believe in a supreme god who creates children, and they practice ancestor worship. Bamum doctors practice divination by interpreting the earth spider's manipulation of marked leaves. Unfortunately, when the French arrived, they were so taken aback by the level of sophistication of the script and the kingdom as a whole that they exiled and killed its leaders in fear that this culture of knowledge would not pose a threat. The printing press and remaining manuscripts that were not destroyed were taken to museums in Europe. This is only but one of the dozens of independent writing systems developed in sub-Saharan Africa, testament to the unending ingenuity of black people. Here are a few exquisite pictures of Bamum people, art and architecture. Buy our Team Coffee on Patreon and follow us, and see how those who are said to be without history birthed civilization itself. <laughs>